Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here for this second of six Christmas lectures on the general subject of planets. In the last lecture, we examined a strange and exotic planet, the Earth, and only after some effort did we discover that it was inhabited, that it had some living creatures on it. Now, the life on Earth is something we're concerned about, that uh, since we're a part of it, we think it very important. And yet that life covers an extraordinarily thin layer of the planet. It is, as Sir James Jeans once said, a kind of rust on the planetary surface. And one question which always arises, every human culture has wondered about it, is how did life come to be? Where did the rust come from? And if we consider any organism, even very simple ones, it's astonishing what they're able to do. Take, take some fairly humble organism, let's say uh, a rabbit. Think of what rabbits can do. One thing they can do is hop. Now, you may not be very impressed with a rabbit's hop, but rabbits hop better than the best hopping machines which people have made so far. Rabbits do it better than we know how to make machines do it. Or consider the munching of lettuce. Rabbits eat lettuce, but not only do they eat it, they convert it into rabbit. Today's rabbit's brains are yesterday's lettuce. Now, we can't do that. We can't take some lettuce and do something to it, and the end product, we have a rabbit brain. But the rabbit is able to do that perfectly well. Probably the rabbit brain never thinks about where the rabbit brain came from. Many human brains never think about where human brains come from. Or think of the remarkable ability of rabbits to make more rabbits. Uh, probably they don't know in great detail how, that's, how that comes about, although the essentials I'm sure they've mastered. Um, that's a very complex business to make a rabbit from scratch and some lettuce. Um, animals and plants are able to do remarkable things. They've been on the earth for a long time, although human beings have not. We are only a few million years on the planet, and life has been here for some thousands of millions of years. And what a remarkable diversity of life there is. Um, for example, let's take a look at some kinds of life on the earth and just remind ourselves about how remarkable it is. This is an orchid that goes to very great lengths to induce insects, and in some cases, bats, to pollinate it, to encourage it to make more orchids. Here is a great rainforest. The largest trees on the earth go to hundreds of feet high. Think of the enormous lushness, diversity, and complexity of the organisms that inhabit this forest. Here is a mosquito able to fly. What a remarkable thing to have things on your back which you flap and away you go. Uh, humans have not figured out how to do that, but we're a lot heavier than uh, the insects. Or here's another organism that's managed to learn how to fly, the only flying mammal, the bat. And here is a cousin of ours, a monkey that eats leaves and uh, perhaps is uh, not so far distant from us as some of us would like to think. And here's lovely organism, the zebra, with a beautiful kind of uh, pattern on its coat. Now, these are all big animals that we're used to, but most of the animals and plants on the Earth are little animals, things so small that we can't see them with the naked eye. And I'd like to spend just a moment on those fellows. So here, for example, are some bacteria, very small, much smaller than the human eye can see are needed, in the process of mating, which they do occasionally, not all the time, to encourage genetic diversity. Here is an aphid, which we're looking straight at, and uh, certainly an interesting beast that ants farm. They use them as domestic animals. Here is one kind of pollen. 
Here is the surface of a leaf. I think it's a geranium, but I'm not sure. These lovely three-dimensional pictures are taken with a machine called a scanning electron microscope. And here is the surface of another kind of leaf. Look at the beauty, the regularity, the geometry which exists in the microscopic world, all produced by biological systems. And here are uh, some microbes which live in snow. And uh, it's quite interesting that there are organisms which are able to live in extremely exotic environments. Over here, we have a bee's knee, close up. Um, bees have knees, six of them. Um, spiders have eight knees. Humans have only two. And you can see that the attention to detail which nature has made at the level of the bee's knee is pretty substantial. And here is an astonishing creature called a tardigrade, which when uh, things are dry, curls up into and becomes a kind of speck of dust and can last that way for very long periods of time, probably thousands of years at least. And um, then when things get wet, you moisten a tardigrade and uh, he uncoils and starts walking away, looking a little bit like a bear with eight or ten legs, however many he happens to have. Let's spend a moment on this lovely film. Here we see a boiling hot spring in Yellowstone National Park. And you can see what the temperatures are, almost 90 degrees. Organisms live there just fine. Here are people in the Antarctic digging a core through the ice. And it turns out in those extremely low temperatures, there are organisms that survive simply fine. Here is a fish that swims in almost freezing water. It has, lovely fish, it, it has a uh, antifreeze like we use in automobiles so that it doesn't freeze over when the temperature drops below the normal freezing point uh, of water. That's a remarkable adaptation and uh, antifreezes came into existence before automobiles. Um, here is um, a kind of organism which happens to love uh, sulfuric acid. It doesn't, doesn't like water at all. There are organisms which can live in hot sulfuric acid but uh, uh, gasp and die when you put them in, in ordinary water. Um, here is one of the most, most remarkable organisms ever to come into existence on the earth, the cellular slime mold. You can see individual cells that have come together to make a kind of cellular collective which uh, is big enough to see, big enough to walk, and is far more exotic than the strangest beasts ever imagined by the writers of science fiction. And in, in my view, uh, life on Earth has uh, far outstripped what our science fiction writers have been able to imagine. Now, this is just a small variety of organisms that I've shown you. Let me, uh, let me show a live organism just for variety. This little fellow, oh good, he stood up for the television camera, um, is a kangaroo rat, uh, so-called in part because he stands on his hind legs. Oh. Um, remarkable, among other things, because uh, the kangaroo rat, at least some people think this is the case, uh, doesn't drink. Uh, gets all its water from metabolic water, that is from eating food and breaking down the food and extracting water from the solids of the food. Uh, obviously a good thing to do if you live in a desert environment. There are many more strange organisms on the earth. Uh, they, there are organisms which have very strange sensory abilities.